Good morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you are here this morning. We had our work Sunday service Sunday earlier, and we've got some things done around the building, and now we're ready to worship. And I am glad that you all are here, whether you're here in person, whether you're joining us online, I am so glad that we can gather together as Baldwin Community United Methodist Church to worship God as one. Once again, thank you for wearing masks. We certainly want to um, keep one another healthy and well through this time, and we all look forward to that day when we no longer have to wear masks and we can gather together. But in the meantime, I thank you for putting on those masks and caring for the well-being of those around you. Once again, we thank Dr. Wayne Ernest for being with us, offering his gift of music to us so that we can sing and delight in the beauty of music. We are so, so blessed. Thank you. Will you join with me as God's own people as we gather our thoughts on worship by offering the call to worship. Will you respond when it's time? Holy One, make your presence known in this room. Move about between the pews, between each of us, pausing in the heart of each one of us. We know that when we gather in the presence of God, goodness and mercy greets us. So how then shall we approach worship today? We will silence the activities of our minds and seek stillness of heart. We will begin quietly, pray silently, and receive God's word openly. Such silence is near to the heart of God. Such a discipline revives the spirit. Come, each one of you, let us open our lives to the warm embrace of God and the vital connection that we bear with one another. Remind us that every one of us are your beloved, created in your image. We are your people, holding your essence within us. Help us to connect with you and with one another during this time of worship. Come, Holy Spirit, we open ourselves to the power of community. Amen. Will you join with me in standing and singing our first hymn of the morning, How Can We Name a Love?
What a lovely song about what it means to be in community with one another. So as God's chosen community, I invite you all this morning to turn to your neighbors and extend the peace of Christ, whether you just put your hand over your heart, whether you wave, or whether you go to that person and say good morning. Let us extend the peace of Christ that, ex that goes beyond all understanding. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Ruth. Many of us have grown up with this small little book of the Old Testament and Sunday school lessons and vacation Bible schools. And we now step into the beginning of the story. Will you hear from verses 8 through 18 in chapter 1? But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house, and may the Lord kindly deal with each of you as you have dealt with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each one of you, in the house of your husband. And then she kissed them, and they wept out loud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go on your way for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, why would you wait until they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been more bitter for me than for you because of the hand of the Lord turned against me. And then again, they all wept aloud. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, she clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has now gone back to her people and to her gods. Return with your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord do thus to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more to her. Amen. to Book Nook. Um, I've been hanging out with artists uh, recently, and as I'm thinking about this new sermon series, Connect, I was like, where will we find instances of connection that really help us drive this idea of being connected with one another home? And I said, my goodness, literature. Literature opens up doors where we can explore what it means to be connected with other human beings and why we would be connected with human beings. So I have my mug for a cup of tea, and I thought I probably needed a pipe, but I don't have one of those. So um, at Book Nook today, we are looking at Harry Potter. Now, before you go to the place of saying to me on the way out the door, isn't this a book of Satan? This is literature, my friends. This is li that's all it is. It's literature. And if you're going to say this to me, you probably haven't read the books as well. The books are about a young boy named Harry Potter. He's a good boy. Early in his life, when he's a toddler, evil comes into his life, 
killing both of his parents, and almost kills Harry, leaving a mark on his forehead that he would wear for the rest of his life, a sign that he had seen the face of evil, and that it sets him on a course for the rest of his life where you know there's probably going to be an ultimate battle between Harry, who brings good, and evil. But along the way, throughout every one of these books, you find a community rallying around Harry. Harry, who thinks he has to go it alone all the time, hears from one of his teachers, Professor Dumbledore, who says in many books, Harry, help will be given to anyone who asks for it. And his friends, whenever there's trouble afoot, say to Harry when he's about to go off and try to solve problems on his own, they say to him again and again, we didn't sign up for you to do this on your own. We are here to help. And if, if you don't let us help, then it's all been a lie, Harry. And at the end of the story, not this book, but all of the books. The final battle happens between Harry and Lord Voldemort, who is evil. And if at first glance it looks like Harry won, but he didn't win alone. During this last battle, every single one of his friends had to play their part in order to defeat evil. And all the sacrifices that had been made on Harry's behalf along the way had to be a part of the final defeat of evil. They're a beautiful series of books, and they scream to us in the church that we can try to combat evil that is in our lives. We're marked by evil um, all of our days. But we can try to combat evil of our own, but really... Really, we need each other, don't we? We need each other to support one another and to encourage one another and to expect that when the final battle happens, we're all together in community, the great city of God that God is intending at the very end. These and many books scream to us who would be Christians, you don't have to go it alone. And better yet, if you are a follower of God, in Jesus Christ, you have a community around you that will fight alongside of you for good in this world. The message is being screamed in books and movies everywhere we look. I think it's about time for us in the church to say, I think I want that for myself. A community of people who believe in me, who love me, and when evil comes knocking at my door, will not leave me or forsake me, but will offer me help. Amen. As the ushers come forward to collect this morning's offering, and I'm not sure we have any ushers this morning, um, so um, maybe we'll get, and get one or two people to collect the offering. Thank you. I love this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we collect our morning offering this morning, just a word of thanks as we support our, our mission and ministry here at Baldwin Community Church. Um, your committedness to this, um, this body is deeply appreciated. Also, as we are collecting the morning offering, don't forget about the ritual of friendship that you'll find in each and every one of the pews. Pa sign your name, pass it along to those who are in the pews with you so that we can celebrate being together this day. Let us collect the morning offering.
Holy God, architect of the universe, you have wonderfully made every delicate intricacy of this world. And then you placed human beings in the center of it all. And as we stumble our way through living our lives in union with your will and in creation with harmony with your creation, we now pause to offer our tithes and offerings this morning. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to show us the way in simple language, loving you with all our hearts, our soul, our mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. May our gifts be dedicated towards the making of this reality of love. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our next hymn is on page number 566 or on the screen, Blessed Be the Dear Uniting Love. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of Mark. Familiar words on what it means to live in the kingdom of God. Hear these words. And one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them all well, he asked, which, is the, which commandment is first of all? And Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have said truly that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all our heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus saw that he answered him wisely and said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I would invite you to receive this affirmation of faith. 
You can say it along with me. You can just let it pour over you. The words are from We Are a Pilgrim People by David Beswick. And it sounds like the Apostles' Creed, so if you'd like to join along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We proclaim Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one, confessing him as Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we acclaim Jesus as the Lord of the church, the head over all things, the beginning of a new creation. We acknowledge that we live and work between the time of Jesus' death and resurrection and the final consummation of all things which he will bring. We are a pilgrim people, always on the way towards the promised goal. On the way, Christ feeds us with word and sacrament, and we have the gift of the Spirit in order that we may not lose the way. We will live and work within faith and unity of the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church, bearing witness to that unity, which is both Christ's gift and his will. We affirm that every member of the church is engaged to confess the faith of Christ crucified. Together with all the people of God, we will serve the world for which Christ died. And we await with hope the day of the Lord Jesus. May this be our prayer always. Amen. Nothing but tragedy greets the reader when you open the book of Ruth to read its first couple lines. Right away, before much ado, you hear that famine has happened in the land of Israel, and that famine is pushing people outside the bounds of the promised land. Emelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons are a part of this great mass movement looking for food, looking for sustenance. And they go into a foreign land, not too far away, Moab. Death takes Emelech first, and then takes the two sons of Naomi, leaving her with herself and her two daughters-in-law who are foreigners to provide for. And if famine and death weren't enough of an indignity, there's another one more. These deaths have made all women, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth, widows. And in that culture and society, it left them vulnerable and with little recourse. It took them to the lowest rungs of society and culture. Famine, death, and vulnerability, any one of these could have been devastating on its own, but Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws face the worst. What will these women do in response? It is said that the letter of Ruth is written in response to the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah declare throughout its pages a great reform happening among the people of God. And if you ever read Ezra and Nehemiah, you will have your breath taken away when it gets to the part where the reforms include, if you have married any foreign wife, and if you've had any foreign children as a result of that marriage, they are to be kicked out of your house and expunged from the nation. Breathtaking that, that this would happen among God's own promised people. But the book of Ruth says, not so fast. 
not so fast. And it tells this improbable story of these women who returned to Israel, both with the status of outsider, as outside as anybody could be, widower, um, and Ruth comes as a Moabitess. She's doubly an outsider. They have no claims to anything that would happen in the rest of the story. And yet Ruth gives us a clue of a transformation that is about to happen. For when Naomi says to her, go back to your family, Ruth refuses to do so. She goes on to say to her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And where uh, you go and I die, there I shall be buried along with you. Ruth, in this huge statement to her mother-in-law, is making her own community. She has no community before she says these words, but when she says, I choose to belong to you, Naomi, she is creating the community that she needs with her mother-in-law. And they return to a nation who's been reformed, who has done questionable things along the way to say to the nation, we still belong. Even though we have every kind of outsider status possible, we still belong and we choose to come back to the nation of Israel. And for her faithfulness, Ruth's and Naomi's part in this building of the new community, Ruth eventually, for this tenacious choice, that she has no idea the repercussions on, will eventually become the great-grandmother of King David. And she will be listed in the genealogy of Jesus in the Gospels because she dared to make community where there was none for her. The past several weeks, we've been talking about bridges. How do we get over impossible things? How do we get from one place to the other and begin to feel our connectedness with others? Neighborhoods connecting to neighborhood, individuals connecting to family and to work. And how do we share the same space when we cross over all of these bridges that are throughout Pittsburgh? These neighborhoods that we course in and out of every day are bound by people who desire the same thing as we do, to be connected with other people. Eberhard Arnold in this, this essay book writes, and when I read it the, not too long ago, I thought, gosh, this is how I feel about what is happening in the world around us. He writes, everywhere the world is going to pieces. It's crumbling and rotting away. And it's going through a process of disintegration. It's dying. And in these fearsome times, hold on to what he says next. In these fearsome times, through the Holy Spirit, Christ places the city church with its unconditional unity right in the center of the world. The only help for the world is to have a place of gathering where people can come and belong, to have peoples whose will, undivided and free of doubt, is bent on gathering with others in unity. Arnold is talking about a radical community where all that we desire brings to us a sense of belonging and a love that extends beyond what is reasonable at times. We gather for worship in hope. We gather in worship for healing. And we gather in worship for connection. 
What one of us doesn't long for the connection that the church provides for us throughout the ages? Connection to each other, to ourselves, and to this God who is intimately connected within our daily life. This longing for connection is probably the most profound fallout from the pandemic. I don't know about you, but midway through, I found myself longing to be with my family, longing to be with my friends. And yet even now, as I schedule, like, do you want to go out for coffee? Do you want to go out for lunch? Do you want to have a meal together? There's this anxiety that comes along with the connection making. But even yet, to be enlivened by the spark of coming together feels rich and good. As we crowd out the noise of this world and say to those who we love, I choose to be with you. Identifying our need as people who hunger and long for community with one another should be a quick returning, but I think we've all found that it's a slow pace going back to what we thought was going to be normal. For many places, uh, we get uncomfortable, we get diseased about being in large crowds, and we, we find that what used to be an easy pick up the phone and say, hey, you want to go out to lunch? is now something we have to think about. We have to to say, like, how do I ask my friend if they want to go out to lunch? It's not as easy as it used to be. It's complicated now. And now that I've said it out loud, how did it get complicated? How did it get uncomfortable? And is there any hope? There is disciples of Jesus Christ hope. Every time we come to this space for ministry, we bring along a history of people who have desired connection making in their story, and we bring Ruth in along with us as our spiritual forebearer. And we come with a, the, this desire for space and ministry and we enter this room and we look and when we pass the peace of Christ it isn't just saying a happy hello and good morning when we're passing the peace of Christ we're looking into each other's eyes and saying I choose you I choose you to be part of my community I choose you to be part of my people with all that that means That out of our collective commitment to God, we choose to be with each other through the trying and the difficult and the beautiful and the joyful. Knowing there will be times of conflict and disagreement, but how else, people of God, will we discover the glory of love if we don't encounter the tough as well as the good? Out of our connection with one another, We gladly bind our efforts with those who are around us, serving God with joy and laughter in the hopes that the hallways of this church will erupt with laughter day after day. And we discover with one another, through glad hearts, the beautiful nature of love everlasting. And then out of our conviction, in the truth of the gospel that we've read here even this morning. Love God and love of neighbor. If we take these two things seriously and work them tirelessly into our days, we will eradicate any boundaries that be in our life so that we do no longer keep people out of our lives, out of our churches, out of our community, but we are the daring people in this world who can say to anyone, you know what, I don't know why, but I choose you. And I choose you because I know God loves you. And I love you because God loves you. And that makes us strong together.
Will you join with me in the unity of this prayer? Let us pray. God, when you made us in your image, you made us for connection. You who are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and without that essential relationship flowing between the various parts of you, our God, we could not experience the beauty of connecting our lives with you and with others. For in your essential connection in the Trinity, we find our own in you. Be with us this morning as we've come to worship, because underneath all of our worship, all of our work that we have accomplished this morning, we desperately want to be loved individually. We want people to see how beautiful we are. We want people to notice our giftedness and our joy. We want others to know that we do belong to the human community and we belong to this church and we belong to this people and we are beloved of your heart. God, you know that sometimes when we gather together, we bluster and we tear down, but hear us when we do that, that we are afraid. And we are discomforted. Return to us when we are tempted to be anything other than people of love, our first love, Jesus Christ. So that in you, we can be the kind of people who will rise up from this place unafraid and sure that we can eradicate any boundary that is possible in this world. And that love will always have the last say. Help us to choose this church and the people who come to worship in the same pew that we worship in week after week. We choose them. In this prayer, we reach out to them that they might know they are beloved of our hearts. And we choose this neighborhood. It's not easy living in a neighborhood, and sometimes we trip over each other's desires, but we still choose this neighborhood that we live in because we believe that there is something special about the people who live here. And like Ruth, we may never know the impact of our intent to love others without boundaries, but you, God, have already begun to write a story that once we've left this earth, the love that we have sown in our witness will bear fruit day after day. Because we desired the kingdom of God, not individually, but we desired the kingdom of God together. And in that notion, we pray, not as one voice, but a great collection of voices, both here in this room and along with the communion of saints that gather with us, invisibly saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, let us rise and sing our last hymn of the morning, Jesus, thine all-victorious love.
please be seated. We have just a few announcements before we part from one another. Uh, thank you to anyone who helped with Service Sunday. We made some um, art for our silver seekers downstairs. We cleaned up around the back here to give the families coming in for child care a new clean look to the back of the church. Um, and we got to fellowship with one another, which is always rich. Um, just a reminder that next Sunday is communion, All Saints Communion Sunday. And we will be having communion along with remembering those who have passed over the past year and whom we still miss and long for. Oh, I have one more as Justin's coming up. I forgot we added this one at the last minute. We are looking for choir members to join with uh, the choir during Advent. So if you don't want a year-long commitment and you say to yourself, maybe I could sing in the choir for a couple weeks, we'd love to have you join us on Wednesday night in the choir room. We just have this little piece that I would love to have sung during Advent, and it just is going to remind us that there are angels among us and that we should not be afraid. And the children's choir is going to join Join us each Sunday um, here in this space to, to remind us not to be afraid. So if you'd like just a short commitment for choir, we would love to have you Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock in the choir room. All right. Uh, I'm really excited about all of the programming that is coming up. We have a lot of exciting opportunities for people of all ages. First and foremost, um, I'm happy to announce our movie, which is uh, our next movie night, which is going to be Friday, November 12th at 7 p.m. And that movie is going to be Pete's Dragon, the newer 2016 version. Um, it's a wonderful, heartfelt movie about... Um, family and community and coming together and loving, uh, loving people who are different than us. Um, so I hope that, uh, you know, kids of all ages um, come and join us for what will be um, a great fun evening. Uh, second, we have two important opportunities if you're looking to grow deeper in the church. For our youth, we are starting up our confirmation class. And for people of any age, we are, are starting up our new member class. Both of those are going to be meeting on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. The new member class will be meeting on the first Sunday of the month, and the confirmation class will be meeting on both the first and the third Sunday of the month. So if you have been interested in growing deeper in this community and finding out what it really means to be part of Baldwin Community United Methodist Church, what it means to be part of a Methodist community, what it means to be a Christian in the fullest sense, then I encourage you to reach out either to myself or to Pastor Pam, and we can get you linked into one of of those classes. Finally, um, we are going to be starting a new book study, which is going to be Sundays at 4 p.m. starting on November 14th, and we're calling it Advent in Narnia, uh, and we are going to be reading the classic book, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. I, I bet many of you read this book when you were a youth, um, and this is a, just a great opportunity to revisit a text that is full of beautiful themes about faith and community. Um, so I hope that you come out on Sundays at four and work through that classic text with us each week. Next week's book nook will be The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I'll give you a thumbnail about what the book is. Um, also, just the last thing, if you want to be a part of the membership class, I have the adult book here with me, so if you just want to run up here after service, it's, it's I Am a Church Member by Tom Rayner. Um, love to get you started in that direction. Hear this benediction. Grant, O oh Lord, that what has been said with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts may be practiced in our lives. This we pray. Amen.